what is trust? And trust is like one of these amorphous concepts that means many things to many people. Um, and uh, it's also been shown that trust is something that gets defined very, very contextually. So if you're talking about trust in the context of uh, business, you might define it one way. If you're talking about trust in the context of organizations, you might define it another way. If you're talking about trust in the context of a, of, of a discussion of philosophy, you just describe it a third way. And the, the same goes for negotiation. So here's, a, uh, here's one working definition of, of trust. And working definition, I mean one that wasn't meant to impress but is meant to, to, to be used, is that, um, is that trust uh, is an expect expectation that one's cooperation will be reciprocated. Okay, so if I cooperate, the other person will reciprocate, with, uh, reciprocate to me in a situation where I stand to lose if the other chooses not to cooperate. So the other can choose not to cooperate with me, and I will lose if that happens. If I still decide to cooperate with them, knowing that they could turn around and not reciprocate, then what I'm doing is trusting them. So trust involves risk, and that's, I think that's the big thing to put on the table. Trust isn't, well, I, I do something and I know what's going to happen. No, I, I don't, I don't um, given my belief of Newtonian physics, I don't trust the sun to rise in the morning. Okay? I, I, I know it will rise in the morning. Uh, other, other cultures have different views towards the sun. Okay? But um, trust is really, it's, it's, that, it's that if you're, if you're crossing a bridge and there's a slat missing, and you decide, you say, well, I'm going to jump over it and, and assume that I, can, that I can make it. Trust is, that, trust is that leap of faith. So it's the tricky, ineffable, problematic thing that matters so much. Um, but it's unguaranteed, and it's a risk. Here's the problem. <laughs> if you read the literature on negotiation, trust means everything. And I think that. Uh, your own experiences might very well bear this out, that in situations where you do have this sense of trust in another, in other words, if you're working with someone who you feel comfortable taking a leap of faith towards, then, and it works, okay, and you are not stabbed in the back, then having taken that leap of faith, you'll encounter that that other person takes leaps of faith towards you, and that you are able to work together with them. So you have trust. Uh, um, being associated with all sorts of all sorts of good things in the literature and 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 all of the good stuff that uh, interest-based negotiation and integrative negotiation absolutely depends on. Because every time, when you think back to the negotiator's dilemma, every time you take a cooperative move, trust is invoked. Okay, that's 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 what's at the core of it. However. Trust isn't something you can control. And that's the scary part. You can't control it on two levels. One is, you know, you can't, uh, you can't necessarily force the other person into trusting you. That's one problem. And two is that you can't necessarily control your own trust patterns. That's something that we'll discuss in a minute. Um, trust being out of your control is, is a bit of a scary thing. If it is so key to negotiation, then what are we going to do if it's just this thing that happens? So we're not going to leave it at the level of something that just happens. We'll break it down, and uh, the literature breaks it down. You, you know, I hope you're familiar with some of that. Um, but there is, um, there is something scary in the fact that it's so unknown, unvague. So if you read Fisher and Urey on trust, what they had to say, at least I, I remember what they had to say in the second edition about trust. I don't remember whether they elaborated on it much in the third edition, but in the second edition about trust, their advice on trust was, if you don't have a good reason to trust someone, don't. That's not how trust works. That's not how people work. And so it's, it's a good thing to keep in mind because it reminds you to ask, wait, do I have a reason to trust them or am I trusting them based on something else? Uh, so in other words, it's not without value, but it, but it doesn't, doesn't cut to the real core of how trust works between people. It also skips over the question, the really important question, particularly for interest-based negotiators, how do I make the other person trust me? Because that's worth gold, right? I mean, 
If, for, for, you know, my decisions, do I trust them, do I not trust them, do I trust them, do I not trust them, how is my lie detector functioning? That's one set of considerations. But if you differentiate between my decision about them and their decision about me, well, here's one thing we can get to work on. How can we influence other people to trust us? As a negotiator, this is the treasure trove. Okay? The more trust you can engender in, in yourself by the other, the better you're going, to, you're going to do in this negotiation. Now, of course, this gives rise to ethical issues. You know, can I, you know scam artists are great at, at, that's what they do, at making other people um, trust them. So, you know, I refer you to discussions on ethics on this. And I also say, let's assume that we're talking about something that, uh, that we really do mean to hold up our side of the deal. We're really telling the truth. We're really telling whatever. Let's talk about our benevolent actions and intentions. How do we make others trust them? Gold mine. Um, <clears throat> here's a list of, of research that is shown without getting into it. It's, it's like a list of all the good stuff, OK? This is what trust can get you if you can manage to make the other party trust you. You can get them to solve problems with you and work with you and cooperate with you and play with you nicely in the sandbox. And, uh, um, and it's also been shown to improve all of those things that affect these things. So it ripples out and it affects information sharing and generosity and friendliness and empathy and liking and so on. But let's get back to the practical point. Where does trust come from? Lewicki and his colleagues and others have written on this, try to break the way trust forms down into different pillars of trust or different sources of trust. <clears throat> the first, they talk about calculus-based trust. And calculus-based trust is, I trust you as far as I can hurt you, in a nutshell. Okay? Um, if I'm someone uh, standing in the doorway of that test with a baseball bat, so I trust everybody to cooperate, you know, kind of the length of my baseball bat. If you're, uh, I don't trust people who might be sneaking around and trying to, to duck in the back. I trust everybody that I can see within reach of my baseball bat not, not to go into the test. If, I, um, if, if we have a contract between us and we have agreed punitive damages of a million dollars for anyone who breaches the contract and turns around and sells to someone else, I trust my counterpart to uphold the contract. How much do I trust my counterpart? One million dollars. That's how much I trust them. And I, and I do not trust them for a million and one. In other words, if someone would offer them a million and one, my assumption or my calculus-based assumption is that they will defect. Now, I also know that other things are playing here, so maybe there'll be other reasons for them to stay in the game. But from a calculus-based or a deterrence-based point of view, that's the way we look at trust. Now, some of you might easily be saying, wait, that's not trust at all. That, that's just punishment. That's just, like, that's just like, you know, beating people up. Fear. fear. That's just fear. And, and yeah, which is funny because fear as an emotion, right? And so people are guided by fear. And this is kind of a very cognitive uh, way of thinking about things. And indeed, this is how uh, economists uh, usually discuss trust, but yeah, but un underlying even the economist discussion is, you know, uh, the underlying emotional effects of, so there's cost, and the cost, I'm, I'm, I have fear of that cost, okay? So uh, even when you try to isolate the cognitive elements, you're, you're likely to slip into, wait, there's more going on beneath the surface. The second type of trust, knowledge-based trust, is um, the more I know about my counterpart, the more I know how he or she is likely to interact and act in given situations, the more I will trust them to act that way in those situations. The third kind of trust is uh, the slipperiest of all. It's identification-based trust. Identification-based trust is that kind of trust that is based on the, on the premise that the more similar we are to one another, the more likely we will be to trust each other. So while that seems to you know, have some logical basis, 
yeah, you know, if we're similar to one another, so we probably have the same values. And we, you know, we, you know, that sounds fine when you're talking about someone who's similar in the sense that they came out of the same womb with you, they were, they grew up in the same house with you, went to the same class with you, and that when maybe even when you look in the mirror, you see them there. Okay, so that that makes sense. That if you were really, really close to being the same person, then you will have some of the same reactions, some of the same values, some of the same. However. When we speak about the full effect of identification-based trust, it means that if I go to three used car salespeople and I'm wondering whether to trust them about uh, uh, whether, you know, the car that they're selling me and they're all telling me it's a great car and I'll never have any problems with it, it's the best car on the market. <clears throat> and I know, you know, not to give anybody a bad rap, and some of my best friends are used car salesmen, but, uh, but you know, I have this concern because everybody tells me, well, you know, you can never trust people. So I'm trying to figure out which of them I can trust. Now I could you know, do a, an in-depth research and maybe find out that all three of them are upstanding members of their community and, and this one is a little more than that and, and try to form some kind of knowledge-based trust somehow around that. But I generally don't. Instead, what I am most likely to do is I will trust the guy with the blue eyes because I have blue eyes. And if I had brown eyes, well, I trust the guy with the brown eyes because they're similar to me. Now, I, I, I wish I didn't have to break the news to you, but now just imagine how many of our interactions and our trust decisions are premised on that. The answer, lots. I don't want to say most, because I don't know. I'm not, not that kind of social scientist who actually knows the answer. Instead, I'm the kind of social scientist who's like, yay, lots. Too, let's, let's stick with too many, OK? That means uh, 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 that, that if someone has gone to the same school with, as I did, I will have more trust in them than someone who did not. If someone grew up, in, oh, you're from Denver too? Cool, wow. So we have this instant bond and instant in-group affiliation and all that, and that includes trust. So the fact that someone, of course, when I was living in Denver, you know, I, I didn't trust anybody in the street more than anyone else. But when I'm in New York, if I meet someone from Denver, <laughs> they're, they're stand-up people. Uh, and that is how we make our decisions. So sometimes it seems to make more sense. You know, you could say if someone went to the same school as we did, so we know what that school's value system or the kind of guys who used to go to that school. Sometimes it, it, it either makes sense or you can pretend that it makes sense. And I think it's more you can pretend that it makes sense. Um, but it really is that we base so many things on that. Now, this is important to know for two reasons. It's important for both of those types of trust decisions. The trust decision of who to trust and the trust decision of how to make people trust us. Okay? As far as whom to trust, I think that here is where Fisher and Yuri's sentence of if you don't have a good reason to trust someone, don't, means that if you find yourself trusting someone, and that's a check-in that you can do every so often, Ask yourself, well, what is that trust based on? And if you don't really know, if it's what you say, well, it's kind of like this feeling I have, which we often say, there's a very good chance that you're talking about something that is sourced in identification-based trust. And I'd suggest that, that that's exactly where, where if you don't have a good reason to trust someone, don't, uh, and that a, that a more kind of a trust but verify uh, uh, type of approach might uh, uh, or a don't trust and then verify approach, depending on, depending uh, to some extent on on, on character and per, on your character and personality, um, but but that might be a better way a better way to go. So you can do this check in every so often. If you remember how strong this is, you'll do a check in. On the other side, as people wanting to get others to trust us, how can we use identification based trust to our advantage? We can in the room on the spot we can create points at which the other notices that we are similar to them and that will engender trust in us. So if we can get better at, I mean, of course the, the best way to start off is just by being trustworthy, okay? I'm going back to the ethical point. But beyond being trustworthy, how can you open the door for that person to even being willing to consider your you know, a, a real material trustworthiness by opening the door through identification-based trust, by being similar to them. If they have kids, and you do, 
let them know that, okay? You know what I mean? And it, this happens in conversation. It happens in the way we present ourselves. It happens in the, really in the first moments of, um, of conversation.